In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. So I'm not sure if it was a bit of the luck of the draw, depending on how you view them, I suppose, that I was assigned on the Rhoda to preach this weekend, where we're focusing on commandments number seven and number eight, which are as follows. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. These two are fairly uh, straightforward. Don't commit adultery. This seems at least less complicated than figuring out how to observe a Sabbath. And don't steal is much easier to understand, in my opinion, than idol worship. But with most quote-unquote simple things, we can miss the depth if we're not too careful. One easy way to approach these commandments is simply this. Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. This one is about desire. While commandment number eight, you shall not steal, this one is about possessions. So commandment number seven, about desire. Commandment number eight, about possessions. But what if it's the other way around? What if it's the other way around? You shall not commit adultery is less about our desire and more about what we long to possess. And you shall not steal is less about the possessions we want and all about the desire underneath that we maybe don't understand. You shall not commit adultery. If there's anything that the church likes better than talking about sex, I haven't discovered it. It's not because the church does, alas, a pretty particularly good job of this, uh, mind you, more because talking about sex is easier than other subjects, like money, and possessions, and gossiping, and being a disciple. So the temptation, if that's the right word, with this particular commandment number seven, if I can be a bit blunt, is just to reduce it to what we do or do not do with our genitals. But this would be a mistake. It's not because our sexual relations are unimportant, hardly. It just doesn't go to the root of the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. If our sexual lives are really about how we discover ourselves as desired, adultery is how another tells us that we are no longer desirable. If sex is really about who we want to possess our heart, adultery is how another tells us they no longer want our heart to possess. That is why I think adultery is so painful, but also that it doesn't have to be the end of a relationship. Couples can stay together after one or both has committed adultery, if and because they can recommit to giving their hearts to each other again, and their bodies follow. God cares about who we give our hearts to. This doesn't mean we don't find anyone else attractive or interesting, but when we commit ourselves to another, particularly in marriage, when we commit to not engaging in adultery, the important thing is to be aware of where our heart has been placed. Do we offer our hearts as well as our bodies to our beloved? Do we do this each and every day? And if not, why not? In the Bible, Israel is described as an adulterous people, not, if you will excuse my crassness, because they slept around, but because they forgot who they had given their hearts to and who had given them their heart. And the thing is this, God still wanted their hearts, even after they had given it away. And God still wants ours, even after we give it away. You shall not steal. 
It's one of the shorter commandments. It's very much the point. Of the ten, almost everyone of any age can understand this one. Don't take that which isn't yours. But again, there is a subtlety to this commandment I think we miss. It is less about what we want to have but don't, and all about how we think we'll feel, particularly when we have that which is not ours. You shall not steal is less about possessions we want and all about the desire underneath, the desire we maybe don't understand. Stealing is just the lazy way to misunderstand our desires. When we commit to not stealing, we commit to being more patient. We commit to learning learning that our desires are more complicated than we thought. Take a simple example, which isn't quite stealing, but it's close. When we purchase something on impulse that we don't really need, but hope will make us feel satisfied. Hope will fulfill a desire. We then discover more often than not that it doesn't. Commanding us to not steal is God's way of giving us a boundary. God's way of encouraging us to bring our desire to God first. Then, if we still need to, to bring our desire to those things that we feel might make us happy, whether they are our own things or someone else's. You know, these last few weeks, of reflecting on the Ten Commandments, hearing others preach and expound on them has made me appreciate them more, not less. I didn't realize how I felt not just indifferent to them, but saw them as a kind of impossible burden, which they very much are in some ways. But now I see them a little bit differently. I see them as God's way of aspiring to be closer to us by helping us avoid those things that cause unnecessary separation, and by lifting up those practices that support relationship. This shouldn't have been a surprise to me, really. This shouldn't have been a surprise if I hadn't taken my eyes off of Jesus, who shows us the fulfillment of all of these commandments, and who fulfills them on our behalf by simply being Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.